Hey everybody, Professor Wills here. So uh, in this mini video lecture, we're going to examine how the cosmos are depicted in art history through a couple of examples. We've been talking a lot about different gods and deities um, and their place in the universe. Um, how about the big picture? How are artists in art history in different parts of the globe representing the cosmos, the heavens, um, its higher order residence, um, what it looks like, and what is our place um, in relation to the cosmos, um, us mere mortals. So let's pivot to our PowerPoint and I'll show you a couple of examples. All right, very good. So there is a famous name in front of you from the history of art from the Italian Renaissance, and that is Michelangelo. You may have heard of what's considered his masterpiece, uh, the painted ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. The Sistine Chapel is not the main um, place of worship at the Vatican. Um, in Vatican City, in the city of Rome in Italy. Um, instead, it was the Pope's favorite chapel at the time of this, its creation, of the creation of these murals um, in the early 16th century, which would put us smack in the Italian High Renaissance, which is considered sort of the pinnacle of Renaissance achievement. It was completed in the technique of fresco, which means, as you might remember in our unit on uh, painting and techniques, that the artist could only paint in sections while the plaster, um, the thin layer of plaster upon which uh, Michelangelo added uh, painted pigment um, would stay moist enough so that both plaster and pigment uh, formed a durable bond together. And that's why um, following some extensive cleaning in the 1980s that the incredible frescoes look as good as they do to this day. So again, when you think about it, the project you know, entailed Michelangelo working 65 feet off the ground um, over the course of four years. Um, in this kind of very tedious, demanding fresco technique and um, creating a work of art that extends some 128 feet from one end of the chapel to the other along the ceiling um, with more than 300 um, unique uh, figures. It's complex, it's riveting, it's dynamic, and that's quite a challenge to achieve. You know, there's one thing um, having, you know, appreciating a work of art that's hung on a wall right before our eyes. It's another to create a uh, complex program of painted scenes that you see from many feet below at ground level um, and to create something that is uh, riveting. Um, what is it focusing on? Well, yes, indeed, it is very religious and it has to do uh, with the story of creation, the fall of mankind, and um, our subsequent redemption. Um, it is uh, organized, if you look at the image on the upper right, you can see it's almost, it's got a, a plethora of figures, but in the center you see these rectangular scenes. It's almost like, you know, the Renaissance version of a PowerPoint where you have almost like a slideshow, if you will, a continuous narrative uh, that talks about all of these events uh, that I've just talked, that I've just mentioned already, you know, from God separating darkness and light um, to God creating the sun and the moon, um, as well as separating water from land. Then you have the creation of Adam and Eve, the first humans, right? Um, and of course, uh, the fall of mankind represented with that uh, temptation of the apple and the expulsion from paradise. So 
What you find here is vivid color and dynamic poses um, that engage the viewer from down below. Probably the most famous painted scene among the many scenes um, by Michelangelo at the Sistine Chapel is the one you see down below here. Um, and that is called the creation of Adam. Um, Adam was created before Eve, so he is the first man. So thinking about it, and you can just make it out in the uh, upper right as well, you can see that its relatively simple composition is very effective. It makes it clear to understand um, from ground level. On the lower left, you have Adam um, reclined on just kind of a green um, expanse, expanse of primeval earth. Um, mirroring Adam's kind of the, the, the arc of his body positioning is a man on the upper right. And this bearded individual, you probably have already guessed, is supposed to represent God. More or less in just sort of left of center of the composition, you have probably the most powerful gesture, um, pardon me, seen in art history. We'll come to that in a few minutes. And that is the meeting of these index fingers that you know Steven Spielberg stole in his movie E.T. the Extraterrestrial. But that is the moment of the spark of life when God um, brings life, creates the first man in the form of Adam. And of course, uh, he is shown uh, full size, um, but nude as any babe is born. But this is what's going on in the Renaissance. There is a interest in um, portraying the human body um, that is part of the reverence of the Renaissance artists of classical Greek um, art. Um, and sort of this heroic nude type is not surprising to see mastered by um, someone of Michelangelo's talent. Now, the power of glance, glances and touch, so these gestures and glances, is significant because there's more to look at here. So if you follow Adam's arm and then continue up God's arm, if you see that God's left arm has another gesture where he is pointing to this small child. There's a woman in between, and you might wonder who that is. Some of you may have already guessed that is supposed to be Mary and Jesus. So though both of those individuals were not involved um, in the history, the biblical history um, of Adam's era, it implies the um, sort of a forecast of the future, if you will. So we have Adam created, Eve will follow, we have original sin um, coming soon. And then, of course, uh, the requirement of Christ being placed on earth um, for mankind's salvation and redemption. So um, all of that is supposed to, again, evoke, you know, the viewer, remind the viewer of the sacrifice um, of Jesus fundamentally. And of course, a reminder to be a good Christian and to remember that. All right, pivoting to a different part of the world, let's head to Tibet and take a look at the mandala of Samvara. So the mandala of Samvara uh, was created around the same time in the 16th century, uh, rendered in water-based pigments on cotton cloth. It measures quite a bit smaller at about 23 inches by 18 inches. So a mandala, as you see in the definition above, is a design with geometric elements that delineate deities, the universe, and wholeness in Hinduism or Buddhism. At first glance, this looks like an image based on a balanced composition of geometric forms. You might notice the circular forms, the square forms, etc. However, there are figures and other details that indicate that this is a map of sorts, a guide to the structure and relationship of all elements of the cosmos. These are meant to be viewed while in the act of meditation. 
to contemplate these entities and one's place among them in the universe. The principal deity can be found in the innermost circle. I know it's a little bit hard to see in this PowerPoint slide. That is Samvara, whose name you see in the title, who rules the universe, and he is accompanied by his female consort. There are eight paths that radiate from the center. So if you count these, you would see eight paths with cosmic references such as rays of light, the cardinal directions, and elements such as water, fire, wind, and earth. Other deities can be found within other circles, as well as representation of the outer circle of the charnel fields of where crema cremation fires burn the bodies of the dead with menacing animals. The very outermost circle has monks, mystics, and other divine beings. The idea is that you can travel from the outermost circle to the innermost as you level up your journey toward enlightenment. Alternatively, you can contemplate the reverse. So center out, which would convey the source of all life. Either direction brings wisdom. Um, and of course, that is aligned to uh, the benefit and the goal of enlightenment, um, whether it, you are a Buddhist or a Hindu. Thanks for joining me.